We are one month into a, a sermon series on tough questions. If, if you're a visitor, what happened was we had a list at the back, and, or actually we handed out pamphlets, and for a while people could write down questions that are puzzling them, and they handed it in, and we, we listed them all, we got them all together, and, and we're going to preach a lot of ser- sermons in this series to answer some of these questions. And last week, we had one of the most important questions that I think a church can deal with, and that's the question of, of nominal Christianity. That's the question of, am I truly saved? Am I really a child of God? And Craig preached a very good sermon last week. And a couple of people have already asked me for a copy of it. We can give you a DVD copy. We can give you a CD copy. And you can even go listen to it on YouTube. It's all there. So you can send links to your friends on YouTube. But the point is, this question is so important to ask. Because I need to ask myself, am I truly saved? The Bible says, make sure of your salvation. And that is a question I can't answer myself. Because if I'm going to ask myself, of course the answer will be yes. Of course I'm saved. I decided I'm saved. You can only answer this question by matching your life against the word and saying, am I living the life of someone who is saved? And sometimes that's a scary thing to do because you realize, I don't. I don't live in obedience to God. He's not my God. I am still my own God. So if you haven't had a chance yet, go listen to that sermon and make sure of our salvations. How sad it will be to get there at the end and to hear, you just called me your God. You never lived for me. You never loved me. You never spoke to me. So go and have a listen there. But today's question is a question that says, why do Baptists not do confessions of sins in their services? And also some other liturgical questions that we threw together. Liturgical is a very big word. And just means the order of the service. So what happens is that we've been very blessed that many new people are coming to our church. And many of them not from a Baptist background. So you might be used to things that happened at your old church. And certainly there's certain things in the liturgy that happened and now you don't find it here. Maybe you come from a very high church where you had a book. And you knew what was going to happen because the guy will say this and then I read this prayer and then we do this. Or, for instance, you had to stand together once a week to say the confession of faith, the Apostles' Creed. Or there would have been a specific time in the service where we speak about the law, we read the law. And then after that, we'll often confess our sins, that we are not like the law, and then we'll sing a song appropriate to confessing our sins. And then you get into the Baptist church, and they don't seem to do any of these things. And you're wondering, but why? Why is it that... Why is the liturgy so loose often in the Baptist church? It's definitely not missing. We also have a sequence of things we do, and we normally do them. But so much that you find in high church and other churches, you don't find here. I myself grew up in a church that that had a very strict liturgy, especially in the beginning. Especially when I was a small child. Over time, it really loosened up, and, and things started falling away and getting more free. But I was fascinated by this as a child, because... There were times when everybody had to stand and they never announced it. And sometimes only the men had to stand when you pray and sometimes everyone had to sit down. I thought if a visitor had to walk in here, this must be very confusing. When do you stand now and when do you sit? Um, And I remember the first time I went to a Baptist church in high school. I went because there was a beautiful redhead girl that went to the Baptist church. Um, (laughs) And I got there and the preacher didn't even wear a tie. And the people really dressed, dressed differently. Some of them had shorts on and some of them were wearing suits. And, and they were all neat, but they looked comfortable. And they were basically just singing, praying, preaching, and sometimes a testimony and, and the obligatory tea and coffee afterwards. But there wasn't much of what I remembered from or, or knew from my church that should be there. And I must say, the first experience is that it doesn't really sit well when someone shakes your tradition. When you're used to doing certain things in a certain way, and now it changes, we don't like change. So then you start wondering about it, and because we like our groove. What do we say when we like our groove? It's like a record player. Children, I'll have to take a day to explain to you. But a record player was something that had a little needle that fell into a groove, and you had to follow that groove to get the music. And if it jumped out of the groove, it made weird and ugly sounds. And he says, people like that as well. I like to know where I'm going now. I like to stay in my groove and do the right thing. That's how we are at humans. But to be honest, walking into the Baptist church, it just felt more real. It felt like they were actually meaning what they were doing. And I want to make it very clear. We are not here to judge 
any other church. Romans 14 makes it very clear. You do not judge the religious observations of another group. They have their master, which is God, and God will deal with them. We are not to judge any other church on what they do. But for us ourselves, we need to ask the question, are we obeying God in what we do? Are we following His word in what we do? And that's a question for us, for our service to answer. So the thing is that the Baptists are definitely not very liturgical, like I said. And it started back in the 16th century already, where all churches were high church. All churches had many traditions and liturgies and things you had to go through and robes and bells and smells and all these things. And the Baptists just looked at this and they, they kicked against this ritualistic church. They say this is far removed from what God planned in the New Testament. These are just traditions of men. And the Baptist started with a desire to be led by the Bible and the Spirit only, not by traditions. This applied mainly to baptism, where they looked at baptism and says, we don't find it in the Bible that children were baptized. We find the model of repent and believe and be baptized. That's the sequence we find in the Bible. But they also rejected the rituals and the hierarchy and the, all those things that you found in the church that they said just based on, on tradition. There are lots of symbolism, but often there's no meaning in the symbolism anymore. It's just become a ritual. So the Baptist said, we want to build our church model strictly on the biblical New Testament model. That's how we want to do church. And therefore, there's n- and that what they saw when they looked at the Bible is that there's no defined liturgy in the Bible. You don't get to one of Paul's letters and Paul says, okay, great, sing for 10 minutes, then stand, then say this prayer. There's no liturgy in the Bible. Um, so the big question then becomes, why do we meet together on a Sunday? Because if you can answer this question, you will know what to do on a Sunday. If I can answer why are we here on a Sunday, then I can start saying, well, if this is the reason why we are here, then these are the type of things that we need to do. And the answer to the why question is this. There are things that the church are called to be and do that can only happen if they meet together regularly. God called His church and He gave a purpose and a a meaning to them and commands to them. And those things, many of those things, can only happen if we meet together regularly. There's often people, people have a saying that say to say that the church is not a building, I am the church. And there's very much truth in it because the church is not a building. But it's also not strictly correct to say, I am the church. We need to say, we are the church. You can't stand alone and be a church. The church are the called together ones, the called out ones. So to use this as an excuse to say, I don't have to come to a meeting because I am the church, it's just not true. We are the church. And so we are called to do things and be things that will only work if we meet together regularly. So now the question is, what is God's model for the church then? Because if we can find out what His model was, we can decide what we need to do. And we know that God's model for the church, Jesus' command for the church, is to make disciples and be my witnesses. We find this in Matthew 28, 19. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. And Acts 1, 8, you will be my witnesses. So the purpose of the church becomes followers of Jesus. In other words, a disciple is someone who follows Jesus. Someone whose life is geared towards Jesus. So firstly, I have to worship God as the church. My life needs to be pointed to Him. But what some churches started doing is that they started building their church model on the Old Testament model of just gathering together and worshiping and not caring about outsiders. And that's not our model. Our model is not just for us to be here and worship God, but to make disciples. So to continually saying, how do we bring more people in? How do we make more people disciples of Jesus? So that's the purpose of the church pointing towards Him, living for Him, and inviting others and teaching them to also point their lives to Him. So now the early church asks, how do we get that right? How do we get it right to make disciples and to be witnesses? What can we do so that this will be fulfilled? And what they did is they devoted themselves to four things. We did a whole sermon series on this. I'm not going to go through it in detail You can also go listen on the web to that. But they devoted themselves to four things. To say, 
To get this right, we need to be devoted to the apostles' teachings. We need to have sermons preached to us. We need to study His Word so that we can know how to make disciples. So that we can teach people who come in what it, who Jesus is, who God is. The next thing is they voted themselves to community. We're not going to save people if we don't love them. Why would anyone want to listen to our message if we treat them like dirt? We need to love and we need to show the example of, of this kingdom of God living together, caring, so that others from the outside would say, you know what, that looks attractive. If that's what it means to be a child of God, man, I want to be part of it. They've devoted themselves to praying because you are focusing on God. You're following Him. You're bringing Him glory. And they devoted themselves to the breaking of bread, which is the communion like we did today. But it's more than that. It's continually reminding yourself of Jesus. So that it doesn't just become about what we do here to each other, but we do certain things just to be mindful. Remember Him. Remember Him. Think of Jesus. Remember what He did. So these are the four things they devoted themselves to so that they could make disciples and that they could be the witnesses. But how did it practically play out? Well, many, many things. Church discipline, providing for needs, help financially, eating meals together, interceding for each other in prayer, confessing sins, thanksgiving, prayers of supplication, testimonies, using spiritual gifts, praising God, evangelism, baptizing believers, singing, Bible study, preaching. This is just a short list. If you read the whole New Testament to see what it practically meant to be devoted to those four things. This is what they started doing as a church. Now, the important thing to remember was, this wasn't the plan for Sunday mornings. This wasn't saying, one hour a week, we better do these things. No. This was their plan for every day. For every day they came together and says, we need to love each other. We need to be community. We need to hear from God. And then the question became, which of these things makes most sense when we do meet together? Which of these things, with the limited time we have together, which of these things that we are called to be and to do makes sense together? And I said, preaching makes a lot of sense. We have gifted preachers who can bring us God's word, our time. Singing. Singing together makes a lot more sense than singing alone. So let's sing together. Praying. Praying at all times. But also praying together. Testimonies. Giving a testimony to yourself is all good, but it's much better if there are people to hear it. So they started picking from these things the stuff that they do, did when they got together. And then the other question became, but when do we do the other things? For instance, Bible study didn't make a lot of sense when they met together for once a week. Because if you have 90 people in a hall, they had 3,000 plus. You don't have time for questions. You don't have time to deal with every person's question. But if you're a group of 10 or 12 people sitting in front of the Bible, sitting around the Bible, you have time to ask your question. You have time to give your, your view on a verse. So that made more sense for other gatherings in the week. Baptizing believers makes sense. Let's do it when we're all together. Interceding for each other, it makes sense that I pray one-on-one, -on -one, but also in the big group. Eating meals together, smaller groups, helping financially, providing for needs. There's a lot of the caring stuff that makes more sense one-on-one. -on -one. There's certain things that I'm not going to tell the whole big group, but I've got this one person that I made a connection with, and I can ask them, you know what, this is the thing I'm struggling with. Please pray for me. And suddenly, the question of what do we do on a Sunday becomes a question of just wanting to be obedient to God and not just living for Sunday. Because the answer is, why, why are we not so liturgical? Is saying, because we don't want to squeeze everything in on a Sunday. We want to do it all week long. And the specific question was about the confession of sins. We don't want to get to a place where we just come through a ritual every week. And I'm not saying everybody does it as a ritual. But we're just every week, oh, okay, we are sorry, we are sorry, we are sorry. Confession of sins must be an everyday thing. Every day, I must go before God and say, God, I, I did not live up to your standard today. Please forgive me. Please empower me for it to be better tomorrow. And confession of sin makes more sense that I confess to the person I sinned to. They say that's how it works. The, the level on what you sinned is the level you need to confess. If you sin to one person, you go confess to them. If you sin to a group, you confess to the group. If you sin to the community, you confess to the community. There will be times when confession of sin happens in the church. There will be times, and we've had it before. When we were praying about the rain, when the drought was going on, 
we confess the sins of South Africa. That might be the reason behind the drought, that people are turning away from God. When we preach our sermon on homosexuality, we confess the sins of a church who in the past treated homosexual people with hate, which is also wrong. So based on what we do and what the topic of the day was, there will be sometimes be time for confession of sin. But we don't want to go through the ritual. We don't want it to let just become a thing. And you know what happened when the church started voting them to, them to this all week long, gathering together, gathering in small groups, speaking to God alone? We read there it says, And the Lord added to their numbers day by day those who were being saved. By spending their time on all these things, all week long, they fulfilled their purpose. They were supposed to be witnesses. They were supposed to make disciples of people. And God did that work because they were obedient to their calling. In conclusion, I just want to say that when we come together on Sunday, our desire is to please God in our gatherings. We don't want to be a social club just going through the motions, busy with rituals. A.W. Tozer said the following, He said, if the Holy Spirit was withdrawn from the church today, 95% of what we do would go on and no one would know the difference. If the Holy Spirit had been withdrawn from the New Testament church, 95% of what they did would stop and everybody would know the difference. You can come together one hour a Sunday and go through the rituals and go through the motions and it doesn't matter whether God is there or not because you have your rituals and you have your motions. But if you choose to live like that every day, praying for Him, meeting the need of others, that is only possible if the Holy Spirit is working in us as a church. And that's a church we want to be. When we want to gather on the limited time together, we'll use it to its fullness. We'll hear God's Word. We'll sing together. But then we walk out and we continue being the church. We continue meeting with others. We continue going to a Bible study. We continue caring for each other. We continue confessing our sins on a daily basis because He is God. And without Him, we can't live one single day. We want to be His children. We want to be His church every day of the week. His church, in His power, obedient to His voice, fulfilling His purpose for us and bringing glory to Him. Let's just pray together. Lord, how wonderful to know that when we stand here praying together now, as we all amen in agreement to do the prayers bringing, coming up from the church, that you are listening. Lord, we never want to run this church on human wisdom, human power, human rituals. Lord, we desire for you to show the way and to give us the ears of wisdom, and ears of obedience to follow you. Lord, and when we walk out of here, And you nudge us and say, that person needs your help, Lord. Let us listen. Let us go in and help, whether it's financially, whether it's emotionally. Help us to be your people every day of the week so that we can fulfill fulfill the purpose of bringing people to you. Lord, we want to pray then as well that when we gather on a Sunday, that you will give us wisdom on what we need to do when we are. That we will not waste time. That we will also not fall into ritual that is just as easy for Baptists as for anyone else. But that when we come and do the Lord's Supper, that we will be mindful of everything we do. That we will remember you and not just go through the motions. When we sing, Lord, that we don't come and think it's a show where we have to give points to the leaders in front. But that we will follow the worship leaders and bring glory to you through music. Lord, our desire is to worship you. And our desire is for others to join us in worshiping you. Empower us to be that in this town. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.